All right, homework 23, we're going to do the ANOVA, mean squares, and common population variance. Emma's on the go, a large convenience store that makes a good deal of money from magazine sales, has three possible locations for the store for its magazine rack. In the front of the store to attract impulse buying by all customers. On the left-hand side of the store to attract teenagers who are on that side of the store looking at candy and soda and in the back of the store to attract the adults searching through the alcohol cases. The manager at Emma's experiments over the course of several months by rotating the magazine rack among the three locations, choosing a sample of 44 days at each location. Each day the manager records the amount of money brought in from the sales of the magazine. Following are the sample mean daily sales in dollars for each of the locations as well as the sample variances. I'm going to move my table up a bit so that we can see what's down there. There we go. So, front of the store, sample size was 44, sample mean 218.8, sample variance 495.9, and so forth. Suppose we were to perform a one-way independent sample ANOVA test to decide if there's a significant difference in the mean daily sales among the three locations. Answer the following, carrying your intermediate computations to at least three decimal places and rounding your responses to at least one decimal place. So, when they ask you what is the value within the group means, what we're going to do is find the mean of the sample variance. So we want the mean of the sample variance. To find the mean of our sample variance, we're going to add all those numbers up and, in this case, divide by three since there's three numbers on our list. So we're going to take the 495.9 plus the 338.7 plus the 490.6. And then once you get that answer, if you go ahead and add all those together, 495.9 plus 338.7 plus 490.6, you should get 1325.2. Now we're going to take that answer divided by 3 because we have three values on our list. When we find the mean, we add them up and divide by how many numbers are on the list. So if you take your 1,325.2 and you divide by 3, we are going to get 441.7 for our value of the within group's mean. Within the group. So 441.7. For the value of the between groups mean, we have a different formula that we have to use. And what we need to do is find the standard deviation of the sample mean. Now you could use the formula for, six, um, this is your sample standard deviation. That's the one where you had the way back square root and you had to do x minus this squared and that minus that squared and so forth. But we're just going to do it on our calculator. And then in order to find the variance, you are going to take that value squared. And then in order to find your answer, you're going to take the sample size times the variance. So, a couple different calculations that we have to do. First thing we're going to do is just grab our calculator and we'll use that in order to find our sample standard deviation. So on our sample standard deviation, we're going to use the sample mean. We're going to put that in list one. So stat, one for edit, and then type in your 218.8, the 212.5, and the 218.1, I scribbled over the 1 a little bit, but 218.1. Put those all in list 1. Again, if I want to find my statistics, I'm going to hit STAT again, go over to CALC, C-A-L-C, and we're going to calculate them on the one variable statistics. We want to do it for list 1 if you're using an older calculator. 
Shift L1, if you've got the newer calculator, list one should be right there. And then enter through those so that you can calculate your one variable statistics. You want the S of X number. The S of X number for the sample mean is 3.45301, so forth. It says that we have to carry at least to three decimal places. You could go a little bit farther than that, but at least to three. So now what we're going to do is find the variance by squaring that number. So I'm going to take my 3.453, carrying it to three decimal places, and I'm going to square that. So go ahead and clear out your calculator. Do second function quit to get back to the normal screen. And do 3.453 and square that number. You should get 11.923. Again, carrying that at least to three decimal places. You could go farther than that, but at least three. Now the last step. Here's my first, here's my second. My last step, take my sample size times my variance. My sample size is 44. I'm just going to use that 44. So I'm going to take my 44 times my 11.923. If I take that 44 times my 11.923, I end up with 524 point, and this is going to one decimal place, so 6. So my between group mean is 524.6. Alright, so within the group, we're just finding the mean of the sample variance by adding them up and dividing by how many numbers on my list, but when it says between the groups, we have to find the sample standard deviation. Easiest way is to use your calculator. Square that standard deviation to find your variance, and then take the sample size times your variance to get your answer for between your groups. All right. Number two, then. Number two says... In an effort to counteract student cheating, the professor of a large class created four versions of a midterm exam, distributing the four versions among the 320 students in the class so that each version was given to 80 students. After the exam, the professor computed the following information about the scores. The exam was worth 200 points. So version A, sample size was 80, sample mean was 158.5, sample variance, 406. Version B, sample size was 80, sample mean was 151.1, sample variance 450, and so forth. The professor is willing to assume the populations of scores from which the above samples were drawn are approximately normally distributed and that each has the same mean and the same variance. Answer the following, carrying your intermediate computations to three decimal places and rounding your response to at least one. So, give the estimate of this common population variance by pooling the sample variances. When they tell you to pool the sample variance, it's asking for the same thing as one it asks for within the mean like we did on the previous ones. So they may word that two different ways. Pooling the sample variance is the same thing as the within where we found the mean of our sample variance. So we're going to start by taking our 406.0 plus our 450.0 plus our 365.3 plus our 353.9. Once we add that together, we're going to divide by 1, 2, 3, 4 since we have four numbers on our list. So go ahead, add those up. 406.0, 450.0, 365.3, 353.9. You should come up with 1575.2. You are then going to divide that by 4. And rounding that off to one decimal place, you should come up with 393.8. 393.8. Sounds good? 
Second part says give the estimate of this common population variance based on the variance of the sample means. When it says based on the variance of the sample means, that's like the one we did where it said between. Based on the variance of the sample means. And you can see why it's named that because we used the sample mean and we found the variance by finding our sample standard deviation and squaring it. So first thing we need to do is find that sample standard deviation. Use your calculator. Stats. One to edit. And then stats. And calculate the one variable statistics. There, I'll abbreviate what we were doing there. Hopefully we've maybe done it enough that you remember how to work that on your calculator. But we're going to go ahead, hit the stat button, hit one for edit, clear out whatever's in there, and go ahead and type in your sample means. When we do that, we're doing the sample means in our list. So 158.5 Enter 151.1, 154.5, enter, and 154.6. So I've got my four numbers in list one. I then hit stat, go over to calculate, hit number one for the one variable statistics. List one should be there unless you have the older calculator. Then just cursor through, and then you're going to look down. It's the fourth one down, the S of X, the sample standard deviation. So rounding that off to three decimal places, S of X is equal to 3.025. 3.025. Once we find that number there, we are then going to square it. My variance is my sample deviation squared, my sample standard deviation squared. So I'm going to take 3.025. I'm going to square that number. So again, second function quit gets you back to the normal screen where you can type stuff in. 3.025 squared gives me 9.151 if I round that off to three decimal places. And again, they say round it off to three decimal places while you're doing your intermediate computations. And then our final answer, we'll just do one decimal place. And so, last thing we do, sample size times the variance. So my sample size is 80 times my variance of 9.151. Sample size times my variance. So 80 times 9.151 gives me, rounding off to one decimal place, 732.1. Again, you may get slightly different answers depending on how far you carry your numbers off. If you round it to three decimal places or if you leave it four or five decimal places, you may get a slightly different answer. And on Alex, it knows that, so that'll be okay if you do that. There it is. Doing the same thing. This one says, at LLD Records, some of the market research of college students is done during the promotions on college campuses. While other market research of college students is done through anonymous mail, phone, internet, and record store questionnaires. In all cases, for each new CD, the company solicits an intent-to-purchase score from the student. 
zero being the lowest, no intent to purchase, and 100 being the highest, full intent to purchase. The manager finds the following information for 100 intent to purchase scores for a soon to be released CD. So the sample size here, since they had five groups, was 20 in each group, since 100 was their total sample size. On campus, by mail, by phone, by internet, in the score, and they have all those, in the store, they have all of those in there. So the manager's next step is to conduct a one-way independent samples ANOVA test to decide if there is a difference in the mean to intent score for this CD, depending on the method of collecting the scores. Round the following, carrying your intermediate, or answer the following, carrying your intermediate computations to at least three decimal places and rounding your responses to at least one decimal place. Now notice they switched them around. The between groups is first this time. So that was the second one we did on the previous two ones. The between groups were first of all, we're going to find our S of X using the calculator on our statistics. Since I don't have a lot of writing room, I'm just going to put that much and you guys can go from there. So we hit stat, we hit one for edit, clear out any data that's in there, put in your sample mean values. These ones right here. So 64.2 plus 66.0 plus 62.5, plus 72.5, plus 66.3. Or not plus, I shouldn't be putting pluses. I should hit equals. I don't want to add them. I want to put them in my list. Try that again. 64.2, enter. 66.0, enter. 62.5, enter. 72.5, enter, and 66.3, enter. Once I have my five values in list one, I'm going to hit calc, or I'm going to hit stat, go over to calc, stat calc one for one variable statistics, and do them on list one, and look for my S of X. In this case, I have 3.787. Rounding that off to three decimal places, 3.787. My variance is then my S of X squared, so 3.787 squared. Again, second quit gets you back to the screen where you can type that in. 3.787 squared gives me... 14.341, rounding that off to three decimal places, 14.341, and then multiplying that by the sample size. Sample size times the variance. We're using the 20 because we had 20 in each sample. So 20 times 14.341. 20 times 14.341 gives me 286.8. 286.8. Again, you may be slightly different depending on if you rounded to three decimal places or if you left it a little bit longer than that. Um, on Alex, again, it's going to give you a little bit of leeway on that rounding because you might have carried your numbers out a little farther. And so if you have slightly different answer, it's probably going to count that okay. Second part of this is when we're doing the within groups. The value of the within groups, we're going to use the mean of our sample variance. So we're just going to add all those numbers together and in this case divide by 5. So 77.2 plus 79.7 plus 105.6 plus 149.7 plus 98.6. Divide that by one, two, three, four, five numbers on our list. So 77.2 plus 79.7 plus 105.6 plus 149.7 plus 98.6 
should give you 510.8. We're going to divide that by 5. If you take your 510.8 and divide it by 5, we should get 102.2 when we round that off to the nearest tenth. All right. All right. Four, five, and six, we're going to do the ANOVA test, degree of freedom, and F statistic. We're going to have both a degree of freedom in the numerator and the degree of freedom in the denominator. So my degree of freedom in my numerator, DFN, will be how many groups minus one. <laughs> I'll write it that way. How many groups minus one? In this case, how many groups do I have? I have one, two, three, four groups. So my DFN number is going to be four minus one, which is just going to be three. How many groups? Here's my groups. I have four of them. My DF D number, degree of freedom in the denominator, is going to be the sample size total sample size total minus my how many groups. So my sample size total would be either I could add all those numbers up. If I added all those, however, it should come up to the same number in this case of how many people they question. So if they have that in the word problem on how many respondents they have, I probably don't need to add those, but just to double check myself, I could add those, take my 256 plus my 269 plus my 256 plus my 292, and it should come up to the 1,073. So I'm going to take my 1,073, and then I'm going to subtract how many groups. We had four groups. So 173 minus 4 would give me 1,069. We're going to need those when we do our F test. So on here, it says... The general social survey is an annual survey given to a random selection of about 1,500 adults in the United States. Among the many questions asked are, what is the highest level of education you've completed? And if you're employed full-time, how many hours do you spend working at your job during a typical week? In a recent year, 1,073 respondents answered both questions. The summary statistics are given in the chart below. The sample data consists of the times in hours per week that were given by the respondents. So if I had less than a high school education, my sample mean was 42.6, my sample variance 110.1, and so forth. To decide if there are any differences in the mean hours per week worked by these different groups, we can perform a one-way independent sample ANOVA test. Such a test uses the test statistic F, the variation between the samples and the variation within the samples. Now, that's what we calculated on problems 1, 2, and 3. They're not going to make you figure out those numbers. They're going to tell you, this is my value for F. So we're going to find the p-value that corresponds to that. So on the Alex calculator, we are going to do p of F is greater than, P of F is greater than our 1.57, degree of freedom in my numerator we figured out earlier was 3, degree of freedom in my denominator we figured out earlier was 1,069. So in the Alex calculator you are going to do P of F is greater than, we're doing the F test, They'll have the number given, already calculated out for you. 
The degree of freedom in the numerator was how many groups minus one? The degree of freedom in the denominator, the total sample size, which either is going to be in the word problem or you have to add up your total sample size, minus how many groups, which again is the four. So if you calculate that out, and it says round to three decimal places here, you should get 0 0.195. That's the percentage, 19.5%. It says, from the survey data, can we con conclude that at least one of the groups differs significantly from the others in mean hours worked in a typical week? Use the 0 0.5 level of significance. So, again, when we're comparing our p-value, 0 0.195, if we get a greater... We're going to accept the null. If it's less, we reject the null. In this case, if I'm going to do the null, the null is that they equal. The alternative one is that they are not equal. So, looking at this, 0 0.195 compared to 0 0.05 level of significance, 0 0.195 is greater, so it says here if it's greater, we're going to accept the null. The null says that they're going to be equal to each other. The question says, can we conclude that they differ? Well, if they're equal, they're not going to differ. So, no, we can't say that they differ. We would have to conclude that they're equal. So my null again is equal, my alternative one is they're not equal, or they differ. Number five then. Chris Turlock owns and manages a small business in San Francisco, California. The business provides breakfast and brunch food via carts parked along the sidewalks to people in, business, in the business district of the city. Being an experienced business person, Chris provides incentives for the four salespeople operating the food carts. This year, she plans to offer monetary bonuses to her salespeople based on their individual mean daily sales. Below is a chart giving a summary of the information that Chris has to work with. In the chart, a sample is collected of daily sales figures in dollars from the past year for a particular salesperson. Salesperson 1, their sample size was 76, their sample mean 205.1, their sample variance 2,593.9, and so forth. Chris's first step is to decide if there are any significant differences in the mean daily sales of her salespeople. There are no significant differences. She'll split the bonuses equally among the four of them. To make this decision, Chris will do a one-way independent sample ANOVA test of equality of the population means, which uses the test statistic F. The variance between the samples, the variance within the samples. They've already done all the math and the calculating and they're going to give you the variance or the value of F, but we need to find the degree of freedom in the numerator and then the degree of freedom in the denominator. So my degree of freedom in my numerator, again, the number of groups minus 1. We have four groups, so 4 minus 1 is going to be 3. The degree of freedom in the denominator, the total of the sample size minus the number of groups. In this case, they didn't give you the total of the sample size anywhere in the word problem, so what we have to do is find the total ourselves. 76 plus 84 plus 50 plus 99. So if you add up all of the totals for your sample size, 76 plus 84 plus 50 plus 99, you should come up with 309 for your total of all of your samples. So I'm going to take the 309. I'm going to subtract the number of groups. Again, we had four groups. So 309 minus 4, 
would be 305. So then I can cal calculate my test statistic, and in case this one here, they divided it up. Give the numerator degree of freedom. Well, we figured that out already. It was 3. Give the denominator degree of freedom, 305. And then it tells me, can we conclude? But if I have to conclude that, I first have to find my p-value. It didn't ask for my p-value separately. So i got to calculate my p-value. I'm going to do p of f is greater than 2.14 with a degree of freedom in my numerator of 3 and a degree of freedom in my denominator of 305. And I'm going to punch that into the Alex calculator and figure out what I get for my number. So if I figure that out, P of F is greater than 2.14, degree of freedom of 3 and in the numerator and the degree of freedom in the denominator of 305, you should come up with 0 0.095. So now we can use that to determine if that works with our level of significance. So if I have 0 0.095 and I'm comparing it to 0 0.01, 0 0.095 is greater than 0 0.01. That means we have to accept the null and the null says that they're equal. We're going to accept that they're equal. So it says, can we conclude using the 0 0.01 level of significance? that at least one of the salespeople is significantly different. We have to accept that they're all equal. That means we can't say they're different. So number six, Joint Soft is a great over-the-counter arthritis medication. But who will ever know about it? Unfortunately, many people with arthritis tend to be elderly and rather Im immobile, so advertisers of arthritis medications face limitations and ways to get their messages across. Currently, their best modes of advertisement are commercials on daytime TV, advertisements in select magazines, flyers in convalescent homes, and believe it or not, advertisements on certain web pages. Marketing managers for Joint Software investigating these four modes of advertisements in four small communities with a different mode of advertisement in each community. The marketing managers have selected 35 days at random and are looking at the daily sales and dollars of each of the communities on each of these days. Here's what they have to work with. So again, they have four groups, TV, magazines, flyers, and web pages. Their sample size for each of them are 35 and so forth. It says, suppose that the marketing manager performs a one-way independent sample ANOVA test to decide if there are differences in the mean daily sales arising from the four modes of advertisement. So they're assuming that the only differences among the four communities is the mode of advertisement used in it, and they're going to use the F statistic. Again, they've already calculation, calculated the variation between the sample and the variation within the sample, and come up with your value for your F test. So we need to know the degree of freedom in the numerator, and the degree of freedom in the denominator. So our degree of freedom in the numerator again, we took the total number of groups, which was four, we subtracted one, so we have three degree of freedom in our numerator. For our degree of freedom in our denominator, we needed our total sample size. Well, since they're all 35, you could take 35 plus 35 plus 35 plus 35, but it'd be way quicker to do 35 times four since we have four groups of 35. 35 times 4 should give me 140. So for the degree of freedom in my denominator, I'm going to take that 140, and then I'm going to subtract the number of groups, which is 4. 140 minus 4 would give me 136 for my degree of freedom in my denominator. So now I can calculate my p-value for my f statistic. We're going to do P of F is greater than 1.71, which is our given value, with a degree of freedom in my numerator of 3, degree of freedom in my denominator of 136. 
Again, we need to put that in on our Alex calculator. P of F is greater than 1.71 with a degree of freedom of 3 in my numerator and a degree of freedom of 136 in my denominator. Hopefully you've punched that in. Zero point, my point didn't show up very well, 0 0.168 should be my value. So using a 10% level of significance, can the marketing managers conclude that the mean daily sales arriving, are rising from at least one of the modes differs from the other? So again, my p-value 0.168 compared to my level of significance 0.10. Again, we got greater. 0.16 is greater than 0.10. If that is true, we have to accept the null. And the null says they're equal. So can we say they differ? No. Again, we have to say that they are equal. They are not different. And so we cannot accept the null. We didn't have any that were less. But if we had one that was less, then we would say that it differed because we would not accept the null. All right. Number seven. It says... The ANOVA hypothesis test in the ANOVA table. A manager at LLD Records is investigating the company's market research techniques. She learns that much of the market research of college students is done during the promotions on college campuses. She also learns there are other methods of performing market research, for instance, over the phone, in a mall, etc. In all cases, for each new CD that LLD records releases, the company solicits an intent to purchase score from the student with one being the lowest, no intent to purchase, and 100 being the highest, full intent to purchase. The manager finds some information on a soon-to-be-released CD. The information details the intent to purchase scores from each of several groups of college students, with each group being questioned via a different method. Based on this information, the manager is able to perform a one-way independent sample ANOVA test of the hypothesis that a mean intent to purchase score for this CD is the same, no matter the method of score collection. This test is summarized in the ANOVA table below. Fill in the missing entry in the ANOVA table, round your answer to at least two decimal places and answer the question. I'm going to move this up just a bit so I can see all of the table. We should need our word problem from here on out. First of all, we have to fill in this number from our table calculating our F statistic. Our F statistic was the mean of the square between divided by the mean of the square error. So we're just going to pull those numbers from our table. Here's my between. The mean of the square was 374.98. The mean of the square error, 92.87. So mean of square between the 374.98, mean of square error, the 92.87. We're going to divide that out and round it to two decimal places. So 374.98 divided by 92.87 should be 404, 4.04. So we're going to put that value, that's the value of our F statistic when we get down to where we have to make a decision on this one. Now, filling in the questions. It says, how many intend to purchase scores were examined in all? What we basically have to do is work our way backwards. This degree of freedom is the degree of freedom in my numerator. This degree of freedom is the degree of freedom in my denominator. We have to think back to the previous problems on how we calculated those. The degree of freedom in the numerator was the number of groups minus 1. So 2 is our degree of freedom. 2 is equal to the number of groups minus 1. In order to solve that, we would add the 1. So 3 is our number of groups. Second part of that then, when I was doing the degree of freedom in the denominator, it was the total sampled, which is what we're asking, how many were examples in all, minus 
the number of groups. So we know the degree of freedom in the denominator was 66. 66 is going to equal the total sampled minus the number of groups. Right here we figured out how many groups we had, which in this case was three. So in order to solve this, we're going to add our three. 69 then is our total that were sampled. So 69 is how many were examined in all. Second part, it says for the ANOVA test, it is assumed that the population variances of intent to purchase scores are the same no matter the method of score collection. What is an unbiased estimate of this common population variance based on the sample? So what that is just going to be is the number from your table. It's the mean of the squares error. We already used that number. Mean of the squares error was 92.87. So 92.87 is going to be the value that we plug in there. All right. So mean of the square error, we're just going to pick the number off the table, put it in there. Next part says using a 10% level of significance, what is the critical value of the F statistic? If I'm finding my critical value, that's what I'm going to do, the F sub something. The critical value, I find my paper, I hit it. <laughs> Well, I'm going to write down what you had to do, and then I'll look for where I laid my paper down when I got interrupted. 10% level of significance, I kind of scribbled on that. So I'm going to have F sub 0 0.10. The degree of freedom in the numerator is in this box here. That's the 2. The degree of freedom in my denominator, that's this box here. It's my 66. So go ahead, punch that part into your Alex calculator. See if I can find my paper I had in my hand just a minute ago. that punched into your Alex calculator. F sub 0 0.10, degree of freedom in the numerator of 2, degree of freedom in the denominator of 66. When you punch that in, 2.39 should be your critical value. So now we want to use this based on our ANOVA test. Can we conclude there are differences in the mean to intent purchase scores for this CD among the different methods of collection? So we're thinking about our normal curve, that our critical value is 2.39. On the left side is going to be your null hypothesis that it's equal. On the right side is your alternative hypothesis that it's not equal or that it's different. I want to find where my F statistic falls in that curve. My F statistic was the 4.04. So, is 4.04 less than 2.39 or is it greater than 2.39? Well, 4.04 is greater than 2.39. That means it is not equal or that it's different, right? Based on our ANOVA test, can we conclude there are differences? Can we say there are differences? Yes, we're saying it's different. And so we would pick yes for our conclusion. Oops. Almost got that to stop where I wanted to. Number eight. Is there a difference in sleep activity among people who differ in daily physical activity? One way to measure the amount of sleep activeness is to measure the percentage of total sleep that is made up of rapid eye movement, 
REM sleep. REM sleep, often linked with dreaming, is marked by very high brain activity. In fact, REM periods may be the sleep periods in which the brain is most active. REM sleep takes up a mean of about 25% of your total sleep time. But if this varies, or, but this varies from sleeper to sleeper. In an experimental study, sleep researchers, researchers examined seven adults who are classified as very active in their daily lives according to such criteria as exercise and type of occupation, seven who are classified as moderately active, and seven who are classified as inactive. The researchers record for each participant the percent of total sleep time over the course of four nights that is spent in REM sleep. The summary is as follows. So here they have the table. Now they're going to make us fill in this information based on what we know from problems one through three and four through six. So this one's going to be a little bit longer because we have to fill in our table, whereas on the previous one, they already had it filled out for us. The researchers do a one-way independent samples ANOVA test of the hypothesis. There is no difference, that there is no difference in percentage of sleep time spent in REM among the three populations of very active, moderately active, and inactive adults. The ANOVA test is summarized in the partially filled in ANOVA table below. Fill in the remaining cells of the ANOVA table, then answer the questions and round your answers to at least one decimal place and your F statistic to two. So I'm going to move this up just a bit so we can see both tables or all of the tables and the questions that we have. So first of all, we have to find the degree of freedom in my numerator, degree of freedom in my numerator. We said that the degree of freedom in the numerator is the number of groups minus one. So in this case, we have one, two, three groups. So 3 minus 1 is 2. We know this number in this table then will be 2. Then we are going to find the degree of freedom in the denominator. The degree of freedom in the denominator is going to be the total sampled minus the number of groups. So in this case, when I figure out my total sampled, I have 7, 7, and 7, so 7 times 3 would be 21. 21 total sampled minus my number, whoops, minus my number of groups, 1, 2, 3 groups. So I'm going to take 21 minus 3, that's going to give me 18. The total then, 2 plus 18, just going to be 20, we're just going to add those together. All right, so the mean of the square. To find the mean of the square, we're just going to take the sum of the squares divided by the degree of freedom. Sum of square divided by the degree of freedom. So in this case, my sum of squares is 49.05. My degree of freedom is 2. So on that top one, 49.05 divided by 2 is 24.5. I'm just going to draw a little arrow. 24.5 is what we should get. For the second box, same kind of thing. I'm taking my sum of squares divided by the degree of freedom. So I'm going to take my 163.8 divided by the degree of freedom, which is 18. So my 163.8 divided by my 18 means this box here should be 9.1. So 24.5 for the mean of squares between my group, 9.1 for my mean of squares error. The last box is your F statistic. Your F statistic is your mean of squares between divided by your mean of squares error. So we're just going to take these two values that we got here and divide them out. So we're going to take our 24.5 divided by our 9.1. 
Now for the F statistic, it says to go to two decimal places instead of one. So 24.5 divided by 9.1 would be 2.69. 2.69. That's the value of your F statistics. So, we got our table all the way filled out. We can go ahead and do the questions now. It says, what is the P value of our F statistic? So again, when we're doing the P value, we're doing P of F is greater than the value 2.69 degree of freedom in my numerator was two degree of freedom in my denominator was 18. So I'm going to find my P value. P of F is greater than 2.69. Degree of freedom in my numerator is 2. Degree of freedom in my denominator is 18. And so I should come up with 0 0.095 is what I should come up with. 0.095. So now we're doing our p-test like we did on 4, 5, and 6. So I am trying to decide is 0.095 greater than or less than my level of significance. Can the researchers conclude using a 0.05 level of significance that at least one of the populations differs? Remember my null is that it's equal my alternate one, it does not equal. So if my p-value is greater than my critical value, I have to accept the null. I have to say that they are equal. Can we say they differ? Nope. We're saying they're equal. And so no would be my conclusion. So this one we did all the stuff we did in the first couple problems to fill in our table. Let's see, here we're back to one like we did on the first one, on number seven anyway, I should say. It says, Emma's on the go, a large convenience store has decided where in the store to put the magazine racks. The manager at Emma's experiments with a selection of different locations, choosing a sample of days at each location. Each day, the manager records the amount of money brought in from the sale of magazines. It's possible to test whether there's a difference in the main, mean daily sales for the different locations by doing a one-way independent samples ANOVA test. The variables of interest is the daily sales in dollars from the magazine at Emma's. In the ANOVA test, the groups are the different locations and the samples are the daily magazine sales actually examined by the manager. The following ANOVA table gives a summary of such as an ANOVA test. Fill in the missing cells of the table round to two decimal places. So in this one, they've got your degree of freedom in your numerator and your degree of freedom in your denominator, but they do want to have you fill in the F statistic. The F statistic there, we were going to do the mean of the squares between divided by the mean of the squares error. So in this case, 1,548.65 is my mean of my squares between. 444.68 is my mean of my square error. So I'm just going to calculate that n number to do my test statistic. Mean of squares between divided by the mean of the squares error. We're going to round this to two decimal places, so 3.48. So, now we got to answer our questions. How many days total were sampled from the manager's experiment? Again, we have to work our way backwards. We said that the degree of freedom in the numerator was the number of groups minus 1. So my degree of freedom in my numerator was 3. 3 is equal to the number of groups minus 1. To solve that, we would add our 1. And so we had 4 for the number of groups. Then we said the degree of freedom in the denominator was our total 
sampled minus the number of groups. So in this case, 184 is the degree of freedom in the denominator. That's going to be equal to our total sampled minus the number of groups, which in this case we said was 4. So in order to solve that, we are going to add our 4. And so 188 is the total sampled. So how many days were sampled there? 188. All right. So for the ANOVA test, it is assumed that the variance is the same for each population of daily cells. That is, for the population of daily cells for each location, what is the unbiased estimate of this common population variance based on the sample variance? Again, that was the mean of the squares error. So I'm just going to pick that out of my table. Mean of the squares error. And so in my table, the mean of the squares error, the 444.68. So it now wants to know on the next part using the 0.5 level of significance, what is the critical value of the F statistic for the ANOVA test? Round your answer to at least two decimal places. My critical value, we're going to do the F sub. In this case, we're doing 0.05 level of significance. Our degree of freedom, degree of freedom in my numerator is 3, degree of freedom in my denominator is going to be 184. So to find my critical value, I'm going to put that in my LX calculator. F sub 0 0.05, degree of freedom in my numerator is 3, degree of freedom in my denominator 184. If you calculate that, it should be 2.65 for my critical value. Last question you can't see on here, it's the yes or no. I'm going to just go ahead and We'll just write our answer over to the side because I don't want to move the board with all the writing. It wants to know, can we conclude at a 5% level of significance that there is a difference? So again, when we're looking at this, our critical value is 2.65. The null is on this side, that's the equal. The alternative one is the not equal. I want to check where my F statistic falls. My F statistics was 3.48. 3.48 is in this section. So in this case, the null is true. So the question says, can we conclude at the 0.05 level of significance that there is a difference in the mean daily cells among locations? We are saying, yes, there is a difference. So our last question, Yes should be the one that you have circled. All right, I'm going to go over problem number 10 again and just explain it a little bit more thoroughly. These are the ones that you are interpreting group means from a factorial design. And it says the Fruit Stuff Corporation, which manufactured dry fruit snacks, is looking to find the best way to display and sell its product. There are two types of stores that sell the snacks, supermarkets and health food stores. There are two possibility of display methods within the store, in the checkout line to encourage impulse buying, and in the snack section. Fruit Stuff selected an equal number of supermarkets and health food stores for an experiment. Half of the supermarkets were asked to display the fruit stuff products in the checkout line, and half were asked to display the product in the snack section. The same held for the health food stores. Half displayed the product in the checkout line, and half in the snack section. After a week, fruit stuff recorded the sales and dollars of its products at each store. Then the corporation computed the mean sales amount for each of the four groups. Shown below are the four possible graphs displaying these group means and answer the questions below and a, a below answer the questions below about these graphs so 
there are two ways they're going to ask this question and they're actually going to ask you three questions but the first two they're going to switch around which I didn't point out when I first went over it so I want to to point out that you have to watch for is the information along the x-axis or along the y-axis when you're looking at these questions and so in my pictures you'll see I drew a bunch of extra lines and stuff in there and I'll explain why I drew those in there um, as I go so the first question there says which graphs show that the two display methods had different overall means choose all that apply so you have to watch to see is the information that they're asking for along the x-axis or along the y-axis in this case the two display methods if I slide up to my pictures were the checkout line and the snack section the checkout line and the snack section are along your y-axis going up and down and so if you're checking that when it's along the y-axis you're looking for are the midpoints of each of the thing the same point so is my midpoint for the first line and my midpoint for the second line the same. So if I look at my graphs, if I look at the first one here, you'll see that the midpoint of my first line would be right here in the middle. The midpoint of the second line would also be right in the middle. They intersect in one point. So that would mean that the two display methods would be the same because they intersect in that one point. Now that's the only one on these four that intersect there. If I look at my other graphs, the midpoint of my top line is up here. My midpoint of my bottom line is down here. They're not intersecting in the same point. There's two different points, two different midpoints. Then if I look at graph three, same thing. The midpoint of the top line is right there in the middle. The midpoint of the bottom line is the middle of that line. Again, they're not the exact same point, so they're not going to be the same. And then if I look at my other two lines, again, the midpoint of the checkout line would be right up here. The midpoint of my snack section would be on the snack section line. They're not going to be the same point. So on that top question, it says which ones, which graphs, um, show that the two different display methods had different overall means. The only one that had the same mean was the first one, and so you'll notice that I checked the option, or graph 2, graph 3, and graph 4. Those have different overall means. Now the second question says, which graph above shows that the two store types had different overall means? The store types were the supermarket and the health food store. You can see those are along the x-axis when you look at those. So when I'm looking at the x-axis, I want to know is the mean line straight or horizontal? So if I would find the mean halfway between each of those, would it make a straight line? So again, if I go back and I look at the first graph, if I found the mean of the two endpoints, I would put a dot right there in the middle. The mean here is obviously where it meets right in the middle. If I would do the mean of those two endpoints, it would be right here, and I would draw a straight line. That's what it's saying. Do you have a straight line? So, do this two, two store types overall mean? Um, it's asking if it's different. In this case, it's not going to be different because I can make a straight line when I find the mean of those points. As opposed to the second one, if I found the mean of my two endpoints, it would be somewhere in the middle here. If I found the mean somewhere in the middle, again, halfway between those two dots, and then the mean of the end halfway between those two dots, when I draw that line, it's not going to be exactly straight. It's slanted. It has a slope going up, not straight. Well, that would have a zero slope. So that would be one that you're going to mark that is different because my mean line is not an exact straight horizontal line. Again, on number three, if I'm looking at number three, I would do my endpoint. The mean of my two endpoints would be exactly halfway between those two endpoints. The mean of my midpoints halfway between there. The mean of my endpoints halfway between there. When I draw that line, that line is slanted up. 
It's not exactly horizontal, so since that mean line slants up, it is not going to, or it's going to have different overall means. So again, I would check that one for different overall means because my line slants up, it doesn't go straight horizontal. And then I do number four, halfway between my two endpoints, I would put a dot, halfway between my two midpoints, I'd put a dot, halfway between my other two endpoints, I'd put a dot, I draw my line, my line again is slightly slanted. It is not exactly straight horizontal. So since it's slanted, it is going to have a different overall mean. So again, when I checked my marks on there, I marked uh, graph two, graph three, and graph four. My bottom one says which graphs show evidence of interaction between the two factors, display method, and types of stores. So it will show an interaction if my two lines are not parallel. If my lines are parallel, then there's no interaction. They don't ever meet. So if I look at my first two, or my first graph there, those two lines are not parallel. Here's one line, here's the other, they meet in the middle. That one does show an interaction, so I would check that. Graph two again, this one goes across, this one goes up. If I would extend those lines, eventually they would intersect. They're not parallel lines, so it would show an interaction. The third one there, if you look at those two lines, those two lines are parallel. If I continued in both directions, I never intersect. And so that one is one that does not show an interaction. And then if I look at graph four, you can see those two definitely intersect with each other. So that one shows an interaction. So if you look at my table there, I have marked that one, two, and four um, show an interaction. Number three is parallel. So since those two lines are parallel, that's the only one I'm going to leave unchecked. And so just some notes here. Um, the mean, if it's the x-axis, you're gonna do halfway between your endpoints, your midpoints, and your other end point and draw a line. If it's a horizontal line, then it is going to not be checked because they're gonna ask if they have different means. If it's a horizontal lines, then the means do not differ. If I'm looking at my Y axis, which was the top one, I am going to find halfway on each of my lines. And if halfway on each of my lines intersect in a point, then it is going to have the same mean. If they don't intersect in the same point, then they're gonna differ. And then on the bottom one, it's going to be, is my, are my lines parallel or not? If they're not parallel, then they're gonna show an interaction. So I'm gonna go ahead and add this in with the ones I did in class for number 11 and 12, but I hope that explains that a little bit more. But watch um, in the question, are you looking at the y-axis values or the x-axis values? The y-axis values will be along the side here. The x-axis values will be on the middle. That will tell you which one of the two tests you want to do. Is it a straight line will be if it's an x-axis and do the midpoints of each line touch, then it's gonna be the y-axis test. All right, number 11, a major television network is considering three potential comedies, Bobby's Brunch, Her Four Husbands, and I Like Larry, a pilot. First episode for each has been videotaped. The network is trying to determine whether some of these shows are better liked than others and whether younger viewers under age 40 tend to have different opinions than older viewers age 40 and above. The network randomly selects an equal number of people under age 40 and age 40 and above. It randomly divides those under age 40 into three groups of equal sizes and assigns a different show to each group. The network did the same for those age 40 and above. Each person watched the pilot episode of his assigned show and rated it on a scale from zero to 20. After the network computed the mean rating for each group of the six groups, shown below are four possible graphs displaying the means, answer the questions. I'm gonna slide that up so we can see the questions based on our graph. So again, 
Witchcraft shows that at least one show had a different overall mean from the other. So, where do we have a different overall mean? So if I'm comparing my overall mean, I'm comparing my average. The average between this dot and this dot would be here. The average between this dot and this dot would be here. Again, my average ends up being a nice straight horizontal line. So this one doesn't have any difference in its overall mean. On this one, the average between this dot and this dot would be here. Between those two dots there. Between those two dots there. And you can see that my line keeps going up. So those ones do have different averages. On the next one, the average between these two dots would be here, between those two dots there, between those two dots there. My average goes nice straight across. So there is no difference. I forgot to check my, oh, I did check my box. Graph two, there was a difference. Graph three, there is not a difference. Graph four, the average between these two dots would be here, between those two dots would be there, here they intersect, between those two dots would be there. Again, all of my averages end up being a nice straight horizontal line, so there is no difference. The only one where my average didn't go that nice straight line is on graph two where it went up. So graph two is the only one that shows a difference. Second one. I'm going to erase those lines out of there. Which graph show the two age categories had different overall means? So here I'm going to compare the mean of each line. So the overall mean here would be right in the middle. The overall mean here would be, whoops, I'm doing the third one instead of the first one. Let's go back to the first one. The overall mean on this line would be halfway between. The overall mean on this line would be halfway between. They're the same dot, so it wants to know if they're different. Nope, they're the same. Here, my average here would be right in the middle. My average here would be right in the middle. I do not have the same dots, so there is a difference. Here, my average here would be right in the middle. My average here would be right in the middle. Again, those are not the same dot. There is a difference. On the next one, the average of this line is a little hard to calculate, but if I just drew this here, my average would be about there. My average here would be about there. And so are those the same dots? No. My averages wouldn't be the same. And is there an interaction? If there's an interaction, they are not parallel. Those lines are not parallel. There is an interaction. These lines are parallel. No interaction. These lines are parallel. No interaction. These ones are not parallel. There is an interaction. So if there's an interaction, my lines are not parallel. Number 12, Pomeroy Restaurant is examining the satisfaction of its customers. The restaurant chain is looking for two possible influences on customer satisfaction. Restaurant location, North Valley or West Hills, and type of meal, lunch or dinner. At each of the two locations, managers choose an equal number of customers, half at lunch and half at dinner. The customers were asked to rate their satisfaction on a scale from 0 to 10. The mean satisfaction rating for each group of the four groups were computed. Shown below are four possible graphs displaying these group means. Answer the questions below about these graphs. So again, do they have a different overall mean? We're going to find the mean between each of our dots. So the mean here would be halfway between the mean here, the mean here. If our line goes horizontal, they don't have a different mean. So here between these two dots, I'd be here. Between these two dots, I'd be there. Don't have a difference. Here, the mean between these two dots would be here. Between those ones here, my line doesn't slope horizontally. There is a difference in that group.
And on the last one, same thing here. My mean would be here, and then my mean would be somewhere here. My line, again, is not going to be exactly straight horizontal, so there is a difference. So I'm calculating the average between my endpoints and seeing do I get a horizontal line or not. The second one, when I'm comparing if the meals had a different overall mean, I'm calculating the midpoint of each of my colored lines. So the midpoint of dinner would be right here. The midpoint for lunch would also be right there. If I get the same dots, then they don't have a difference. I got rid of my answers for these ones. Let me get those back. <laughs> On the second one, the midpoint of this line for dinner would be here. The midpoint of this line for lunch would be here. Those are two different dots, so yes, there is a difference. On the next one, my midpoint for dinner would be halfway on the blue line. My midpoint for lunch would be halfway on the red line. Those are two different dots, so there is a difference. On the next one, my midpoint for lunch, halfway between there. For dinner, halfway between here, I have two different dots. There is a difference. And then which graph shows there is an interaction? If they are not parallel, there is an interaction. Those lines are not parallel, so there is an interaction. These ones are parallel. Here we have a not parallel. And on the last one, those are not parallel. So if there is an interaction, they are not parallel. So first question, you're going to figure out the average between the endpoints. And if my line goes horizontal, then there is not a difference. If my line does not go horizontal, if I could draw straight, then there would be a difference. Second one, you're going to find the midpoint between each of my lines. If my midpoint ends up being the same, then there is not a difference. If my midpoint is two different dots, then there is a difference. Third one, if there's interaction, there is not a parallel line. So these lines were not parallel, these lines were parallel. And 13, 14, and 15, we're doing a two-way independent sample ANOVA test. Pomeroy Restaurants is examining the satisfaction of its customers. The restaurant chain is looking at two possible influences on customer satisfaction. Restaurant location, North Valley, West Hills, River Glen, or Hillview, and the type of meal, lunch, or dinner. At each of the four locations, a random sample of 10 lunch customers and a random sample of 10 dinner customers were chosen. Each customer sample was asked to rate a satisfaction with the meal on a scale of 1 to 10. The mean satisfaction rating for each of the eight groups were computed and are shown in the graph below. So here we have North Valley, West Hills, River Glen, and Hillview, and then dinner and lunch, dinner being the blue line, red being the lunch line. After checking that the assumptions for the test were satisfied, analysis for Pomeroy restaurants performed a two-way ANOVA test. The dependent variable was customer satisfaction rating, and the factors were meal and location. The partially filled ANOVA table is shown below. below. Complete the table and answer the questions after the table. Do not round any values in the table except the F statistic value. You should round to at least three decimal places for the F statistic value. Again, I'm going to go ahead and move this, really jumped, so that we can see what the table looks like. We don't really need the graph. It's there for fun, but we don't really need the graph. So, on here... The degree of freedom is going to be the number of samples, or the number of locations, I should say, the number of, in this case, locations, since I'm doing locations, minus one. In this case, we have one, two, three, four locations, so we're going to do four minus one, which is three. For our meals, they already figured out our degree of freedom, but in that case, 
we had two different meals, two minus one, two minus one. Two minus one was one, and that's where that number came from. They already put that in, in your table for you. So for the number of interactions, you are going to take the degree of freedoms from the first thing times the degree of freedoms from the second. So in this case, we're going to do one times three. One times three is three, and so three is going to go in there for your interactions. All right. The mean of the squares, just like before when we did the mean of the squares, we are going to do the sum of the squares. Sum of squares divided by its degree of freedom. So in this case, they took 0 0.8 divided by 1 and got 0 0.8. On this one, we're going to take 8.1 and divide it by 3. So if you take 8.1 and you divide it by 3, you should come up with 2.7. On the next one, we're going to take 15.9 divided by 3. 15.9 divided by 3, if you divide that out, you get 5.3. For my F statistic, for my F statistic, you are taking the mean of the square error divided by, oh, the mean of the square divided by the error. That's what I was doing. So for my F statistic, the mean of the square divided by the error. So for this box here, they took the 0 0.8 divided by the 1.163 to get the 0 0.688. For this box here, we are going to take the 2.7 divided by the 1.163. So the mean of the square divided by the error number. So if you take 2.7 divided by my 1.163, we get 2.322. 2.322. Now when they said to go three decimal places, 2.322. And then on this one here, we're going to take our mean of square 5.3 divided by the error 1.163. If you take your 5.3 divided by your 1.163, you get 4.557. So 4.557 goes in that box. All right. So degree of freedom. I take the number of items I have from the table minus one. So the meals, we had two meals, two minus one is one. Locations, we had four locations, four minus one was three. The interactions, we're going to multiply those two numbers together. One times three is three. Over here for your mean of squares, you take the sum of the squares divided by the degree of freedom in that row. So here they took the 0 0.8 divided by 1 to get 0 0.8. We took 8.1 divided by 3 to get 2.7. We take 15.9 divided by 3 to get our 5.3. On the end, for our F statistic, we are going to take the mean of the square divided by the error. So on the top one, they would have taken 0 0.8 divided by 1.163 to get the 0 0.688. Then we did the 2.7 divided by the 1.163, which is our 2.322. And lastly, we did the 5.3 divided by the 1.163, which is our 4.557. So filling out that table. The question says, what is the p-value for the test for an interaction between these two factors. 
So again, we are going to find our p-value. So we're going to do p of f is greater than. And then we want it for the interaction. Here's the interaction. And so we have to use the f statistic for the interaction. If it said meal, we would have used the one for the meal. Location, we would have used the one for the location. It wants to know the one for the interaction, so we're going to use 4.557. The degree of freedom for the numerator will be the degree of freedom for my interaction. The degree of freedom for my denominator is going to be the error. So in this case, the degree of freedom for my numerator, because we're doing interaction, is that number. The degree of freedom in the denominator is always the one with the error. So in that case, 72. So you're going to do P of F is greater than 4.557, since that's the F statistic for the interaction. Degree of freedom for the numerator is the degree of freedom for the interaction. The degree of freedom for the denominator is the degree of freedom on our error. When you calculate that out, you should come up with 0.006. So, again, I am checking my p-value, 0.006 compared to my level of significance. At a 5% level of significance, can the analysis conclude that there is an interaction. So, 0.05 is my level of significance. This is less, right, than that. So, on this case, since it's a less than, we are going to reject the null. In this case, for the null, we are going to say that there is no interaction. For the alternative, there is an interaction. So in this case, we are rejecting the null. So we are saying this is not true, so this is true. There is an interaction. So at a 5% level of significance, can we conclude there is an interaction? Yes. Because we rejected the null, we have to accept the alternative hypothesis, which there is an interaction. If your answer is no, answer the following question. Where our answer was yes, so we don't have to answer the following question, we can just skip that. So, only answer it if you get an answer of no. Since we got an answer of yes, we can just go on. Number 14, a major television network is considering three potential situation comedies, Bobby's Brunch, My Ex-Husband's, and I Like Larry. A pilot first episode for each has been taped. The network is trying to determine whether some shows are better liked than others and whether younger viewers under age 40 tend to have different opinions than older viewers age 40 and above. The network randomly selected 30 people under age 40 and 30 people age 40 and above. It is randomly divided under those, those under age 40 into groups of 10 and assigned a different show to each group. The network did the same for those age 40 and above. Each person watched the pilot episode of his assigned show and rated it on a scale of 0 to 20. After the network computed the group mean rating for each of the six groups, the group means are shown in the graph below. So they did the graph for Bobby's Brunch, My Ex-Husband, and I Like Larry. After checking the assumptions for the, t the tests were satisfied, the network performed a two-way ANOVA test. The dependent variable was pilot episode rating and the factors were viewer age and show. The partially filled ANOVA table is shown below. Complete the table and answer the questions after the table. Do not round any values in the table except the F statistic value, which you should round to at least three decimal places. So again, I'm going to move this up so we can see our questions. 
So here again, we're going to take our number from our table, the number of groups, I'm going to call it, minus 1. Viewer age. We have two different viewer ages, so 2 minus 1 is going to be 1. Just to show you for the shows, we had three different shows. 3 minus 1 was 2, and that's how they got that answer. For the interaction, we're going to take this one times this one. So, 1 times 2 is 2, and that's how we got this number here. So, how many viewer ages? We had two groups minus 1, which is 1. How many shows? We had three shows minus 1, which is 2. We then multiply those two numbers to get that number from the table. Mean of the square. We're taking the sum of the square divided by the degree of freedom. So on this one, we're going to take 0 0.07 divided by 1, which of course gives me the 0 0.07. On this one, we would take the 2.53 divided by 2. 2.53 divided by 2 is our 1.265 they already have there for us. On the next one, we're going to take our 3.33 divided by 2, the sum of the squares divided by the degree of freedom. 3.33 divided by 2 is 1.665. 1.665 should be the number that I get when I take our 3.33 divided by 2. Then for the value of our F statistics, we're going to take the mean square divided by the error number. So for this one here, our mean square is 0 0.07 divided by the error, 2.523. So you're going to take your 0 0.07 divided by 2.523, which is 0 0.028. Zero point zero two eight. On this one, we would have taken the 1.265 divided by the 2.523, and they got 0 0.501. They already did that calculation for us. On the last one, we're going to take our 1.665 that we got for our mean of our square divided by the 2.523, which is our error. So 1.665 divided by 2.523 should be 0 0.660. 0 0.660. Once we have our table all filled in, we can answer our question. This one says, at the 0 0.05 level of significance, what is the critical value? We're going to do the critical value instead of the p-value. So for our critical value, we are going to do F sub 0 0.05, since we're doing the 0 0.05 level of significance, for an interaction between the two factors. So again, this is for the interaction. So for the interaction, this is my degree of freedom for my numerator. This is my degree of freedom for my denominator. So, for my degree of freedom in my numerator, I add a 2. Degree of freedom in my denominator, I have 54. So, I'm going to do F sub 0 0.05. Degree of freedom in my numerator is 2. Degree of freedom in my denominator is 54. When I calculate that out, I should get 3.168. So, on this one, we are doing that critical value. So, our critical value is 3.168. Our null is over here. Our alternate one is over here. This is no interaction. This is that there is an interaction. We are going to check our test statistic. It says, can we conclude there is an interaction? So if there is an interaction, we are going to use our F statistic up there, which isn't very big. Our test value is 0 0.660. Would that be less than the 
or greater than the 3.168. In this case, it's going to fall in the section for the null. So if it's in the section of the null, we're going to say there is no interaction. Can we conclude there is an action, interaction? No, we cannot. Since we answered no, if your response is no, answer the following. At a 0 0.5 level significance, for which factors can the TV network conclude there is a significant test? So what we're going to have to do now is find our F statistic or critical value for each of these two factors. So for the viewer's age, we're going to do F of 0 0.05. My degree of freedom in my numerator is going to be the 1. My degree of freedom in my denominator is still the 54. So here I have to use the degree of freedom from whatever thing I'm checking, in this case my viewer's age. I was trying to see where I wrote that answer down at. So in this case, F sub 0 0.05, degree of freedom in my numerator, which was 1, my degree of freedom in my denominator, which is 54, gives you a value of 4.02. I'm going to compare that then on my F statistic for my test value. Again, if my critical value is 4.02, and my test value is 0 0.028, that test value is going to fall being in the smaller error, error area. Yep, in the smaller area. So in this case, we're going to say, nope, there's no interaction there. Now I'm not done yet because I tested the viewer age. Now I have to test the show. To test the show, Oops. I am going to do F sub 0 0.05. The degree of freedom in my numerator would be the degree of freedom for the show, which in this case is 2. And then the degree of freedom in my denominator is my error again, 54. And then I'm going to calculate that value. Well, that happens to be the same thing I did when there was an interaction because my degree of freedom was the same number. So I should get that same value, 3.168. On this one, when I'm doing my comparison, I ran out of room. I'm going to put it up here. 3.168. Here's my null. Here's my alternate. I'm looking at this test statistic. So 0.501. Again, that's going to be less than the 3.168, so we're going to say there's no interaction. So on this one, there wasn't an interaction from the viewer's age, there isn't an interaction from the show, so we're going to check neither in this case. So when we do this, we're going to do our critical values for the degree of freedom from the viewer age, the degree of freedom from the show, we're going to compare those using our F statistic for each of those separately and see does it fall in the no, in the null, which is no interaction, or does it fall in the alternate one, which means there is an interaction. All right, number 15 will be our last one here, if I can find number 15. So on number 15, a psychologist is interested in people's views on various crimes. She has produced videotaped reenactments of two different nonviolent crimes, jewelry theft and credit card fraud, and has asked viewers to give the length of the prison sentences in months the perpetrator should get as punishment. 
The psychologist is looking at differences in the perceived seriousness, seriousness of the crimes and also at whether there is an influence of the viewer's self-reported political position as conservative or liberal. She randomly selects 20 conservatives and 20 liberals. She divides the conservatives at random into two groups of 10 for each crime. She has a different group of conservatives watch the reenactment, as she did the same for liberals. After collecting the participants' prison sentences judgments, she computed the group mean judgment for each of the four groups. These means are shown in the graph below. So we got our graph. We've got two here, two here. I'm going to slide that up a little bit. So we need to fill in our table. So again, for the degree of freedom for each of these separately, we're taking our number of groups minus one. Here we have two groups, two minus one is one. That's how we got this answer. Here we also have two groups, two minus one is one, so this is gonna be one. So in both cases we have two groups and two minus one is one, so the degree of freedom here is one, the degree of freedom there is one. Our interaction, we're gonna take the two degrees of freedom and multiply them together, so one times one, gonna still give me one. For the mean of squares, again, we're taking the sum of squares over each degree of freedom, which in this case will be easy because they're all over one. 72.9 divided by one is 72.9. 3.6 divided by one is gonna give us 3.6. 8.1 divided by one, gives us 8.1. We wish they were all that easy. We just have to divide all those by one since all of their degrees of freedom is one. Our F statistic, the mean of the squares divided by the error number. So in this case, they would have taken the 72.9 divided by the 8.36. On this one, 3.6 divided by 8.36. On this one, 8.1 divided by 8.36. So again, we're going to do those two calculations. 3.6 divided by 8.36 should give you 0 0.431. 8.1 divided by 8.36 should give you 0 0.969. So what is the p-value for the test for the interaction? So I want to do my p-value. I am going to do p of f is greater than, and since I'm doing the interaction, I'm using the f statistic, which was this one right here, 0 0.969. My degree of freedom in my numerator would be the degree of freedom for the interaction, which is one. My degree of freedom in my denominator is my degree of freedom for my error, which is 36. So P is greater than 0 0.969, degree of freedom in the numerator one, in the denominator is 36. I might have those backwards, but the one and the 36 are in the right spots, whichever the label of my boxes are there. Either that or I wrote it on my paper backwards, which I could have. <laughs> and so I should come up with 0 0.331. 0 0.331. So, we are going to then test this. Since we are doing our p-value, we are going to compare that to a 0 0.5 level of significance. 0 0.331 compared to 0 0.05. 0 0.331 is going to be greater then 0 0.05, so we are going to accept the null that there is no interaction or no difference. So, can we conclude that there is an interaction? No, we can't conclude there is an interaction. If our answer is no, then we have to test each thing separately. So in this case, we are just going to go ahead again and just test the critical value even though we did the p-value here. We're going to do the critical value like we did on the previous problem. So, 
for the first one. We are going to do F sub 0 0.05 degree of freedom in my numerator would be my political position, which is 1. Degree of freedom in my denominator, going to be my error 36. So if I calculate that out, we are going to come up with 4.11. Testing, 4.11. Here's my null, here's my alternative. I'm going to look at my p-value, my, my f statistic is 8.720. Well, my 8.720 is in the H1 section, so there is a difference here. Yes, there is a difference. Before I check my answer, I've got to check my other part. On my other part, I'm doing the type of crime. For the type of crime, we are going to do F sub 0 0.05. The degree of freedom in my numerator, again, is going to be the 1 for type of crime. If those numbers were different, I'd have to be careful, but it's the type of crime degree of freedom, so it's going to be 1. The degree of freedom in my denominator going to be my 36. And so since those two things, they look the same because my degree of freedom for both of these were the same, I'm going to get the same number. So I should get my 4.11. However, I have to use the F statistic that I got for type of crime. The F statistic for type of crime was 0.431. 0.431 would fall in this first section in the null where we said no, there is not a difference. So we found there was a difference in the political position but not in the type of crime. We're just going to check, oh, there's a difference there in the political position when I do my test. So if I get a no here, I'm going to find my critical values for each of these separately making sure the degree of freedom in the numerator is the degree of freedom for each of those two things separately. And then I'm going to compare them to the F statistic for each of those separately.